Genesis. Now the whole earth has one language and the same words. And as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Sinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had bricks for stone and beaten them from uh, mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with itself in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole world. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortars had built, and the Lord said, Look, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose will, to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there, so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and then they left off the building of the city. Therefore it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's read responsively Psalm 104 as printed in the book. How manifold are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, with its swarms too many to number, living things both small and great. There go the ships to and fro, and the leviathan that you have made for the sport of it. All of them look to you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it. You open your hand, and they are filled with good things. When you hug your face, they are terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, and they are created. And so you renew the face of the earth. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. O Lord, rejoice in all your works. You look at the earth, and it trembles. You touch the mountains, and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will praise my God while I have my being. May these words of mine please God. I will rejoice in the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Hallelujah. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from Acts. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues, as of fire, appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. 
No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. Philip said to Jesus, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me, that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything, and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today, again, is the day of Pentecost. It is the day that we remember uh, the Spirit being poured out on the disciples as we heard in uh, the second reading. And it was so powerful that everybody just assumed that these fledgling Christians were drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. There was something that was going on among them that didn't seem quite right. It was different than what others were experiencing, and they just assumed, oh, well, the easiest explanation is that they're drunk. Peter says, it, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. We haven't had enough time. There's something else going on here. Let me tell you about it. There is an ongoing kind of debate about what's going on at this, this moment when the Spirit shows up and suddenly everybody is able to hear the gospel in their own language. And as you heard today, this passage is often paired with the story of the building of the tower at Babel, which would eventually become Babylon where they built a tower and trying to reach into the heavens and God said it won't work this way and scattered them by confusing their languages. Some have said that this is kind of a reversal of what happened at Babylon. Others have argued, no, it's not a reversal, it's something else. I kind of guess lean in the direction of it being something else. I think there is a connection to what's happening 
had the Tower of Babel and then what happens at Pentecost. But I do believe that at Pentecost, rather than a reversal, it is God's embrace of the diversity within humanity and a celebration of it. Rather than a uniformity, there is a unity that is given to the people. So then what is happening? How is this a, a different kind of reversal if it's not about if it's not about uniting humanity in a uniform way, then, then what is going on? For me, I think that the power of this story emerged in a conversation that I was having with a friend. There's so much going on in our world, starting with our own lives, uh, the, the inability to seem like that we just can't get anything together. As soon as we think we've kind of gotten everything put together, something gets yanked out from underneath us, and it's something that happens that's outside of our control. It's not something that we could have planned for. It's not something that we could have adjusted for at, ahead of time. It just happened, and it feels like it's always happening right as we're starting to get our lives put together. That's just what's happening at a personal level. Our church, the ELCA, is deep in a struggle, our denomination is deep in a struggle as it's trying to figure out how to combat the systemic racism that exists even within the church. And at the same time, how to care and protect for the, those who have been wounded, either by the process or by other ways that the church has acted. You add on to that ongoing fears about how our nation runs itself, the kinds of decisions that it could make that affect the lives of people that seem far too full of politics and less about care for the other. There is still and yet an ongoing war in several places, even the ones that are not as heavily te televised. Economic fears continue to loom. All of these are so big. They're bigger than we are. They encompass our lives. They affect us directly. But they're too big for us. That is Babylon. That's the empire. A system so big and able to back and frame us and, and manipulate our lives. And much as Toni Morrison describes in her book, Jazz, which I borrowed some of that language from, that, you know, the, the city, maybe the empire, will tell you you're free to do whatever you want. But if the grass is okay to walk on, it will let you know. And all the streets are already marked out and paved to tell you where you can and cannot go. That's the kind of situation that we find ourselves in. And that's the people who began building their own tower to heaven. There's a French uh, theologian uh, whose name I will not attempt to pronounce because I will mess it up. Uh, but he wrote a book called The Meaning of the City. And he talks about how God started everything in a garden. It was humanity who built the first city, Cain, in fact. It was Cain after he had murdered his brother who was kicked out of the garden who went and built the first city. And since then, the city has kind of become the epitome of human achievement and human failure. The city, in some ways, is always an attempt for humanity to build itself up into heaven. Babylon, with its tower, Rome, Egypt, all of these empires were building things and reaching up towards godhood on their own terms. 
And God continues to say that that will not work. The outpouring of the Spirit, I think, is God's own gift of something that is way bigger than we are, but it gives gifts rather than makes demands. The Spirit provides us, by the way, just a little footnote here, uh, gender and God are a big thing, uh, and how we view God shapes how we view other people. Uh, God has a lot of, especially in English, very masculine-sounding names, Father, Son, and, and yet one thing that our English translations have kind of hidden from us is the spirit, who is she? Uh, if you think back to the creation story when it says that uh, God hovered over the waters of the deep and the, the breath or spirit of God, depending on the translation, it's all the same word, breath and spirit. Uh, the, that the breath or spirit of God hovered over the waters. It says she brooded over the waters. And so when you get later uh, to that passage where it says God created humanity in God's image, male and female, God created them. That's what it's talking about. God has already been both he and she. And in the Jewish understanding, everything in between. So this mothering God is poured out on us to give us gifts, to empower and strengthen us with the sevenfold gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's, by the way, my, my clever attempt over here with seven candles. Don't ask me to name them right now because I'm going to botch it. But there are seven gifts, and there are things like there, there, there are things that give life rather than things that make demands. The spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of wisdom, knowledge of the Lord. The things that we say at baptism. Those same gifts are poured out on us, something that is bigger than we are, to create space for life in the midst of empires that keep building things the wrong way. To give us the gifts that we need to build community the right way. This nurturing, caring, mothering God appears among us, but not gently. The disciples are gathered in the room. It was as if there was a rush of wind and something like flames danced over the disciples' heads. This is raw power, divine power poured out on us because this is a God who intends to live with us. Yes, transcendent and all-powerful, but among and present with us. That's why John's gospel is such an interesting pairing with all these other things, because John is insistent that God's desire is for us to abide in God and that God will abide in us, to live with us, to stay with us, and as uh, we would have celebrated last Thursday, the ascension of Jesus, that Jesus is present with us now in a different way, having returned to that uh, right hand of God, whatever that looks like. That God is not withdrawing God's presence, but is with us in this profound way, continuing to be present with us, continuing to build God's people in our very midst. That is the promise and gift of Pentecost, a promise and gift that we were given at holy baptism, a promise and gift that we are reminded of as we read the scriptures and we return to this table. God is with us and God is for us. And God is constantly creating among us space for life in the midst of things that are way too big for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.